We're back. We're back in action. Taryn Southern was having some audio issues, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can get her back on, and hopefully her audio will be okay. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Happy Wednesday. Women Crush Wednesday time. You guys wanted somebody who knows about AI. I found somebody who knows about AI. Taryn Southern is about to join us, and so there she is. Let me see if I can accept her. like the landscape of AI people are like should it be something we should be afraid of what is this look like so we're gonna get her on there she is <laughs> let's see if this is better you sound okay. better too. oh my gosh wow yeah that's a lot better that was really funny I was speaking and and it was like having multiple data <laughs> inputs in your brain happening at the same time I was like this is this is not working very well um okay I don't remember where I was but now the audio is better so for people tuning in Taryn Southern has her finger on the I wanted a female to discuss AI and you, know, you and I had like a pre-production pre-interview call and I think let's just start off with people who are tuning in like what exactly do you do in the AI space Sure. So I currently work in neurotechnology, which I like to think of as the intersection of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. So the company that I work with, BlackRock Neurotech, is um, an, a leading brain computer interface company. We build implantable technology for people with paralysis and ALS, um, as well as other neurological disorders. And those implants in the brain basically use machine learning and artificial intelligence technology to decode neural signals so that these individuals can connect to their digital devices via just thought. So um, for instance, connecting to a computer, being able to write emails, operate robotic arms, play video games, like anything you can do with a digital device, these individuals can do with the help of this interface. Um, so that's a very specific use case of AI, <laughs> brain computer interface, and that like in and of itself is deserving of, you know, I mean, there's so much depth that we could go into in that. But in the like sort of general space of AI, I've been, I've been playing and experimenting and working since 2016. Um, as I was saying a little bit earlier before all of the audio issues happened, I was um, in a Google artist in residence program here in Los Angeles and was playing with a bunch of sort of early nascent tools that the engineers were building, um, Google Deep Dream, <clears throat> Google Magenta, Incense. These were mainly um, audio music tools, but also visual tools. And I was just completely mind blown. I was like, this, this is insane. Like th this technology is absolutely gonna change the face of production for entertainment. Um, but it was still, you know, at that time you had to, there, there was no easy front facing interface to use. There was no like AI for dummies, which now I, I would say we're finally at, at that time and space where we have plenty of platforms that are AI for dummies. You know, you can upload a bunch of photos of yourself and get an AI generated image of yourself. I mean, that was not possible seven years ago. You'd have to learn a lot of code and be in, inputting all of your own data. So um, long story short, like I've been playing and experimenting in AI space for six, seven years now. Um, but I'm personally really interested in, you know, the ways in which we can use AI to actually empower our lives. Um, and we can talk about all the really scary stuff too, because that's equally as fun. But well, let's start with scary stuff, because I think uh, people are intimidated by it. Parents were right. well. I maybe. I'm not, I'm not. You're cutting in and out a little bit, but I'm not sure if that's me. Okay. Okay. So, can you hear me right now? Better. Ish. Okay. I won't go too long. Should we be afraid of AI technology because people in my circle and spoken with go if they go right to sky like Terminator Two robots killing people and we just don't really know the future of something because the technology is moving so fast sure. of ai uh absolutely <laughs> absolutely i mean i think any new technology 
we should be conscientious of the the implications that'll happen downstream. And, and we can never anticipate what any of those implications are because everything else is evolving and moving so quickly that as society is changing, you know, so are these technologies and it's just really hard to know what the, what the consequences and the opportunities are. Um, I think it's pretty obvious when looking at something as powerful as AI that, that feels um, like it has this kind of hyper intelligence and quite frankly is able to do things that humans are not capable of doing. Um, there's a ton of there's a ton of existential risks from privacy, security, uh, to just downright you know that depending on how intelligent they become, if we get to AGI, will they like decide that we're just viruses on this planet and it's better to dispose of us? I mean, if I was in artificial intelligence, I I would it, you don't have to work too hard to arrive at that conclusion. That, that's that's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, because I think the limitations of AI, our own limitations of what we can imagine it to be. And so that's where I'm nervous about if technology gets into some wrong hands, yeah. which um, is very likely. Okay, so be concerned, but I think also educate. Um, where do people start? I mean, you've been in the space for six, seven years, so you've you've got a pretty good like grasp on the technology and places of evolution. Like, where would you recommend our parents who you know, even with the onset of the internet a little bit before our parents, um, they were hesitant to try to understand it. So I feel like we're entering a space of like this new technology because it doesn't affect us right now. Not it, but I think that we should. Where, where people start to get a little standing up knowledge. Absolutely. So I, you know, it's interesting. Hi, Alan. <laughs> One of my friends just joined. <laughs> By the way, speaking of AI, I should be utilizing the AI filters right now because I haven't put on my face yet today. So let's see what happens when we add an AI enabled filter. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, look at how cleaned up I became in literally two seconds. <laughs> you do that. I need a filter. Uh, so you just click on the little face button on the camera and it just uh, pops some, I did the smoothing filter. So now all of a sudden it looks as though I've had a number of laser <laughs> treatments or something. Oh, oh, wow. I look so much better. I'm going to not do that. because I feel as though that's, uh, it's so easy to do. That's the other thing that nerve-wracking is it's so easy to do see what you look like with these like more enhanced features and don't get me wrong i i would it's a pipe dream i would love to look like a supermodel but um i am nervous for our younger girls with you know all the things that we can do i mean it's bad enough i have makeup on and i you know it's like i want to enhance my features but First um, of all, you um, look beautiful <laughs> you you know what yeah. Stop caring so much about how I look and try to become really present about what I stand to gain when I can help influence and educate people when I have guests like you on because that to me is way cooler um, and way more impactful than like looking perfect. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I there, we could go into so many different directions with yeah. this. Like, um, but by the so way, and we, I had a oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I had I had an interesting conversation about the AI filter thing last week, and I actually posted a video on my Instagram page, a reel, where I was trying out some of the, the newest, most advanced filters with TikTok. Because, and this is, again, this is very AI centric. You know, the filters that they've come up with on t TikTok uh, withstand, um, how would I say this? Like, um, object obfuscation. So, so like moving your hand in front of your face, like Instagram filters are really not very good at, at I mean, you can't tell, this filter is pretty subtle. It's basically like a smoothing filter, but it's, it's not very good at piecing together the filter while there's movement in front of it. Whereas these TikTok filters have, the, their, their machine learning capabilities are so good, they've nailed it. And you really cannot tell when someone's moving something in front of their face or has a hat on or glasses. And so anyway, I was doing a video about this 
And I'm, I'm like you, I think it's so much more important that we focus on other things than, than um, not just focus, like the, the focus that we're placing on, on these things and how young women are, are looking at these. Sorry, I'm getting the sound thing again. Okay, it's gonna be okay, Taryn. You can think and have weird sounds come out of your phone at the same time. I think it's time to take my iPhone in for a checkup. Maybe that's what's going on. I thought it was Instagram, but it's clearly not. Um, but then I had another thought recently, which is that, um, you know, especially now that we've become this virtual world where most meetings happen on Zoom and we're not necessarily in person, like, I, I actually um, appreciate the fact that we can have some filters that would allow us to have, like, a made-up look without actually having to put on makeup and have all of these toxic chemicals on our faces every single day, right? I mean, like... Yeah, and now I can't hear you, um, but that's okay. Oh, maybe somebody tried to happen sometimes. Well, there's one, there's one AI or app where you submit 17 or, yes, 17 or 10 photos out on headshots, and I did it. Like, I don't look like any of these people, so. Yeah. But it was like, it was so convenient because then I don't need to put makeup on, I don't need to a photo, photo or you know you get do a fitting i was like oh this is convenient so th there's some elements of saving time but anyways i think it's really interesting involvement with neurotech and als talk a little, little bit about what you're doing in that space because you come a little bit and I think he's progressing with since als um there is technology that they can use and maybe a four uh, uh, and Hawking's had to have the, the technology eyes. Yeah, so um, I didn't catch the, the very the last part of the question. Um, so you might have to repeat part of that again, but Stephen Hawking um, is actually a great example. He, I mean, he lived a very long time with ALS and that is, um, I mean, he's like such a unique case in that way. But a lot of ALS patients, after a certain period of time, um, they're no longer able to use eye trackers because their their eye movements also, you know, give way to the disease. And so, um, in the case of the patients that we're working with, I mean, these are these are patients where you're, you're basically connecting them. You know, you you implant them with the BCI so that you can start tracking and analyzing their brain signals prior to them losing the ability to use the eye trackers. Then once they lose that ability, they're, we're able to continue analyzing their brain signals so that they can communicate. So um, we, we've had a couple of patients um, with pretty astounding results, and I unfortunately can't go into the details of those, but um, there was another question, there was another part of your question that I missed. Um, no, I think that you kind of, you answered it. I was sort of asking just about the technology and how AI is helping move forward. I think another people are nervous about jobs that will be lost with the new onset and wave of AI employees or robots. Um, who benefits the most that is not a robot from, from AI? Um, and how do we compete in this new era of where you, you don't even need a writer to write a script anymore? Um, talked about the entertainment industry impacted and so many other industries being impacted. Could you shed some light on that? Okay, yeah, there's so much I have to say about that. I'll start with actually going back to something that you said earlier, where something along the lines of how our grandparents, you know, were resistant to certain technologies when the internet came along and now like we're in this new position where we're resistant. And I think part of this is part of, Something that's going to be really important is just ensuring that everyone has access to learn about these technologies, experiment with them, see how they can incorporate them into their workflow. There's a re-education process that essentially every job is going to need to undergo. And um, I do think that there, that we are going to have, I, I think we will have an uncomfortable period. I think uncomfortable is probably putting it mildly. Um, where we figure out 
what exactly our our you know what exactly it is that we want to do with these AI technologies and how it's going to impact our workforce. I don't know if you saw the headlines around IBM saying that they are not going to hire. There's eight thousand jobs that they are now cutting as a result of artificial intelligence. Um, I think that those kinds of headlines are we're, we're going to continue seeing them, and it's going to scare a lot of people. I think there there will also be some new jobs um, created as a result of these technologies but not nearly enough to supplant the numbers of people that will be essentially replaced. And or another thing that will happen is as we just become more efficient at doing certain things, utilizing these tools, a lot of jobs will, will just shift and evolve. And it, suddenly, I think a lot of em employees at companies are going to find themselves doing three jobs <laughs> instead of one. And you know, for, for good and for bad, there's a, there's a lot of impact that this is going to have, absolutely, on the job market. And I, I'm actually really scared about that. I think we, we can't live in a country where 50% of our workforce or a third of our workforce is unemployed. That's not sustainable. That's not OK. Um, that being said, we also have an opportunity um, I, I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think of the last time in history that we saw this kind of disruptive technology affect the workforce, probably the advent of autumn, like machines in factories, right, that like took over a lot of jobs that people were doing hand manual labor. I mean, this is going to be such a, a disruptive shift. It's an opportunity for us to also reevaluate what our um, kind of heuristics are around around work in general, like the whole eight to five American work till you die or work till you retire ethos. I mean, there's an opportunity to reevaluate that and say, does that work for us? Is that making any of us happier? Um, you know, a new study in Europe was looking at four day work weeks for the past. I think five years they've been doing this study, three to five years, and finding that employees are not only happier, but they're more productive at work when they work Monday through Thursday. So anyway, I'm not trying to be um, uh, a lot dismissive, dismissive about the, about the, the um, I mean, because I think this all is really alarming. <laughs> and so I don't want to be dismissive about the set of problems that are in front of us, but I also, think it's important to not forget about the the opportunities that arise from the discomfort, which is like, why do things have to stay? Not everything should maybe stay the way that it's always been. Um, this is an opportunity to look at the way we've done things and say, this is not actually to our benefit. And how, how can we use AI potentially as a tool to get us there. So I don't know, I'd be very curious to know, and maybe people in the chat can say, if, if artificial intelligence forced all of us into either a four day work week or a part-time schedule where we were all making a little bit less, but everyone was able to maintain their jobs. So we all still had, you know, food on the table and income coming in. I'm curious, like, would people accept that? Yeah, I mean, I'm in. Is like that's a great way to be happy with a four day week work week and feel a little bit a little less but have a, a different um ethos when it comes to work because I, I agree that that phrase of like live to live like where do you laurels and I think there's a lot of people that um live to work. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times in for me when it's the weekend I'm annoyed because like I can't engage with business <laughs> when it's the work week and I'm like wait what backwards like I, I I need to chill um but it's just a really scary time now because we are up to inflation the, the rates are high uh, uh everything mark I get employees off no one's getting an increase in salary. So there's this like in, in, in our community, and it is going to be sort of scary. And as you mentioned, uncomfortable to see how this all shakes up and where the are going to go. I know I'm very short on time. 
with you. But I had a conversation with a gentleman who has a daughter college. And he literally said, he goes, I am trying to figure out what my daughter should take. I mean, obviously she's figuring it out. He's like, I'm trying to guide her to the space of what she could that would potentially be replaced by it. Do you have thoughts on that? I mean, is, but is that something like can give young people advice regarding they be studying because think about going to college how expensive it is and then you graduate college and you don't have a job and the job you were going to school coding or design now oh out like come that's my that's crazy yeah i ooh, i mean i have a little of a, like a slightly unpopular opinion and i'm a big fan of education and i loved college so much i studied anthropology which I've clearly not used <laughs> in my life, but I, I mean, I, I absolutely loved it. I think that we'll see a, a big shift out of four-year college degree programs. It's too expensive. People aren't actually using them in their field of work. Unlike our parents and our grandparents, we're all switching careers multiple times over. And um, so I think that generally there'll be a movement away from four-year degrees in some form. Um, that being said, in terms of like telling young people what they should and what they maybe <laughs> should contemplate staying away from as a matter of um, cushioning themselves against the effects of AI, it's so hard to say because this, this is accelerating at breakneck speeds. And it's, it feels like every week, I, I, you know, I get daily newsletters on AI applications and I'm just, even I'm in this, I'm in this every day and I'm like, wow, I can't believe that now they're utilizing it for this and for that. There are some clear areas like, um, you know, radiology. I wouldn't be going into a career in radiology right now. I mean, artificial intelligence is already better at diagnosing and, and, and finding tumors in, uh, in scans than radiologists. Like that's one area. Uh, I, I would maybe not, I'm trying to think of what some of the, a lot of these are the sort of like knowledge worker jobs. I mean, copywriting, marketing, communications. I think those things will absolutely still be around, but just truncated. Um, legal professions. Um, I mean, coding, that's a, that's a crazy one, right? Like, didn't think that we would maybe see a shift in, in the number of coders being hired, but if if AI is able to do it, then that's that's another area that I would maybe re-examine. Re but I but I say all of this. I say all of this, like take it with a grain of salt because. And also for those people, for those people who are in those jobs, a the job is not going away yet, and b I think that there's an opportunity to integrate AI into the practice of the job to figure out, you know, how this like symbiotic relationship between, as we were saying earlier, human intelligence, and artificial intelligence can work together. I mean, you use the word re-examine. And I think that that's, uh, I think that's what we need to do when it comes to making choices in all uh, facets of life. And then being, what is, and, and how are these trends impacting these different industries? And I think the thing is the most empowering is knowledge, time and time. And AI is something that is, and how is it going to impact young people? How is it going to impact great things? I had interviewed a gentleman who works for Meta, I mean, or putting together AI for Meta. And he didn't seem afraid of the technology, um, but I, but he works for Meta. <laughs> right, that's why I said it exactly. I was like, he was afraid. But I so worth knowing that, um, you know, it's just it's just educate, it's learn about it, figure out how uh, you can guard against it, and you really can take education and how that's going to look and how, you know, obviously the medical world, I mean, there's a lot of really cool exciting things happening in the, the, the medical space and medical industry. Um, so uh, I guess we'll just, we'll wait and find out, but I'm just grateful. I, have, you know, you 
you're so bright, intelligent, and you're generous with your knowledge. And I just appreciate you taking a lot of time out of your day and dealing with the issues and, you know. Thank you. I'm so sorry, A, that I was late, and B, that I have these crazy audio issues. Now I know that there's something wrong with my, it must be my speaker on my iPhone. Pretty soon, thank AI you for allowing me to know this. Absolutely, thank you again, and uh, maybe circle back in a year and see how we can talk about how things have changed. Hopefully, not too. Much. Maybe they will. Um, Terry, mm -hmm. girlfriend, thank you again. This was so. This was so fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll see you later, Aaron. Bye, everybody. Bye. Aaron, see you guys.